Okay, here we go. Chapter six, Ralph S. Mouse, The Maze. Come on, Ralph, old buddy. Ryan scooped Ralph out of the fishbowl. Show them how smart you are. No one thought there was anything unusual about Ryan speaking to Ralph when Ralph was in plain sight. Children often talk to their pets. Ralph struggled in Ryan's hand, which smelled of the egg sandwich he had eaten for lunch. Take it easy, Ralph, said Ryan. You can do it. I need to warm up first, squeaked Ralph. Ryan paid no attention. Possibly he did not hear because of the murmurs of excitement as pupils gathered around for a better view of the maze. He set Ralph down in front of an opening in a cardboard wall and said, When Brad fires his cap pistol, go for the peanut butter. Ralph shook his paws in a last desperate attempt to limber them. At the same time, he sniffed, trying to get wind of the peanut butter at the end of the maze. Unfortunately, the room was full of confusing odors. Popcorn, tomato sauce of tacos eaten by those who bought school lunches, peanut butter, bologna, egg, orange, banana, those eat by those eaten eaten by those who brought lunches from home. Ralph caught a whiff of grape bubblegum, the reek of sweaty socks, and the scented soap fragrance of Miss K. By the time the teacher said, on your mark, Ralph was completely muddled. He crouched, waiting for the starting gun, which did not go off. My caps are stuck, said Brad. After the heat of the fishbowl, the cooler air made Ralph's muscles feel rigid. He felt as if he had been waiting forever. You see Ralph? Whoop, where are we? There he is. And the peanut butter. Do you think you could make it through that maze? I think you could. At last, Brad fired his cap gun. Bang! Go, Ralph, go, shouted the class. The noise was enough to unnerve the bravest mouse. However, since Ralph had pointed toward the opening of the maze, he knew where to start. He ran through the opening and bumped his nose against a cardboard wall. Then he turned the other way. No, shrieked the children. Not that way, the other way. Ralph followed their direction and bumped his nose again. My motorcycle, he thought in despair. I'll never get my motorcycle back if I don't do it right. Ralph, don't let me down! Ryan's voice rose above the shouting. Down among the partitions of the maze, with so many lunch-smelling brooders breathing on him, Ralph had no idea of the direction of the peanut butter. Ralph D. Mouse! Brad yelled. Everybody be quiet and give him a chance! screamed Melissa. Suddenly, Ralph was angry. He knew he was a really smart mouse. Why should he have to run around banging his nose in front of all these tacos and sandwich gobblers? Nimbly, he leaped to the top of the partitions, caught a whiff of pure peanut butter, and took off across the top edges of the maze. He would show them who was smart. Ralph was halfway to the peanut butter when he felt Ryan's egg sandwich smelling hand close around his body. Hey, said Ryan, you aren't supposed to do it that way. Ralph, feeling that the world was unfair, found himself back at the beginning of the maze. He was furious. No one had said he had to bump his nose on every single dead end in the maze. Why should he? The object was to reach the peanut butter as fast as possible. On your mark, said Miss Kay a second time. Bang, went the cap gun. Ralph leaped to the top of the partition, nimbly ran across the top of the maze, and filled his mouth with peanut butter just as the last bell rang and the room mother began to pass out bags of popcorn. Ryan picked up Ralph and poked him into his shirt pocket. I told you that wasn't the way you were supposed to do it. He sounded disgusted. Ralph, who was unable to defend himself when his jaws were stuck with peanut butter, felt Ryan was most unjust. Class, I wish we had more time, said Miss Kay, as her pupils crunched popcorn and scrambled for their wraps. Time and school buses waited for no one. Hey, Melissa, said Ryan, how come you're taking your boots home? Because my mother says I can't watch TV all weekend if I don't, answered Melissa. Ralph struggled to free his jaws. Would he get his motorcycle back or wouldn't he? He had to know. Ralph, dumb mouse, said Brad. 
Just because you don't have a mouse, Ryan sounded angry as he slid his arms into his parka. You're jealous, that's what you are. Who wants a smelly old mouse, scoffed Brad. You stink, and so does Ralph D. Mouse. You be quiet, said Ryan. Make me, said Brad. Ralph was terrified by the sound of scuffling. With great effort, he freed his jaws and managed a muffled squeak. Me! I'm here in your pocket! Don't let him hit me! His voice was so smothered by the parka that no one could hear him, but Ryan must have remembered. He cupped one hand over his pocket, which left only the other hand for protecting himself. He was pushed, bumped against someone, and fell to the floor. The class began to shout, Fight! Fight! and crowd around as popcorn scattered. Boys! Miss Kay's usually gentle voice cut through the commotion. Hurting people does not solve anything. It only makes things worse. Ryan got to his feet. Ralph, shaken but relieved to find himself uninjured, peeped out of the shirt pocket. To his horror, he saw Ryan reach into the pocket of his parka and pull out a crushed crash helmet and a little red motorcycle broken in two. His precious motorcycle. His only means of transportation four feet didn't count, was destroyed. Ralph experienced the darkest moment of his life. I'll get you for this, Brad, said Ryan as Ralph slid back to the depths of the pocket. You broke Ralph's motorcycle. Brad laughed. He could. He had not been knocked down. Are you crazy or something, he asked. What do you mean, Ralph's motorcycle? Here's the fight. Boys, that's enough, said Miss Kay. Hurry along, Ryan, or you'll miss your bus. In the hall, Ralph emerged from the pocket to confront Ryan. Now see what you've done, because you wouldn't give me back my motorcycle. You've gone and wrecked it. Ryan, flushed and humiliated, turned on his friend. I don't care if your motorcycle is broken, he informed Ralph. It serves you right for not doing what you were supposed to do. I never should have brought you to school in the first place. See what happened because I tried to be Mr. Nice Guy? Some nice guy, said Ralph with a tiny snarl, wouldn't even let me have my own motorcycle. And now look at it, busted. Well, I've had enough. I'm getting out of here. With that declaration, Ralph climbed out of Ryan's pocket, ran down his jeans, and jumped to the floor, dodging waffle stompers and boots as he fled. Hey, watch it, called Ryan. Don't get stepped on. He turned and ran for his bus. Ralph dodged feet until he was safe against the wall where no one would step on him or even notice him in the crowd. As soon as all the children had left, he made his way to the library without bothering to nibble any of the popcorn squashed on the floor. The torn book bag in which he had jumped, in which he had enjoyed such comfortable naps, was gone. But he found a fresh bag, gnawed a hole in the brown paper, and crawled into the soft, ready-chewed stuffing. How good it felt, warm cozy and comforting, after all he had been through this terrible afternoon. In the hall, Mr. Costa was sweeping up popcorn with his broad broom while his transistor radio sang a sorrowful song about a broken-hearted man trying to hitch a ride on a lonely stretch of highway while the coyotes howled in the night. After Mr. Costa left, the school was silent, deserted, was a silent, deserted place. The next morning, the children did not return. Ralph, who did not understand that there was no school on Saturday and Sunday, had never been so alone in his life. He stood in the cold and empty hall and squeaked as loud as he could, but his tiny voice could not even raise an echo. All weekend, he roamed the desolate halls and classroom, half-heartedly nibbling whatever he could find to eat, going, <sighs> because he missed his motorcycle so much and wondering if he was doomed to roam forever the lonely corridors of the Irwin J. Sneed Elementary School. Why didn't the children return? Ralph thought of the old hotel lobby with its shabby lo the old hotel with its shabby lobby warmed by a crackling fire. He missed the reassuring tick of the rasping old clock. He missed watching television and the activity in the lobby the arrival and departure of guests, and the arguments among the staff. He missed old Matt, his protector, and supplies of peanuts and popcorn from the Jumping Frog Lounge. 
He wondered if his plan to make the little mice leave the lobby had worked, and if Matt had still still had a job. Ralph discovered he even missed, sort of, his little brothers and sisters and cousins. He wondered if the littlest one still fell over his own feet and became tangled in the fringe of the carpet. He wondered what they would say if they could see him now, cold and lonely, in the vast, empty school. He also wondered what they would say if he went home with Ryan out his motorcycle. Something like, yeah, yeah, serves you right for not wanting to give us rides. The scoffing of his relatives was something Ralph could not face. Never. As he walked slowly back to the book bag in the library, he heard a dog bark in the distance and was reminded of the coyotes that howled in the night in the song about the lonely man trying to hitch a ride on the highway. What a sad world he lived in. And that's the end of chapter six. Chapter seven is the Cucaracha voice. See you next time.